Blessed be God Almighty, who gave us another week and uh, kept us safe. For all his blessings, for all his guidance and forgiveness of sins, for another opportunity to have this virtual worship service. When I was getting ready for today's sermon, everything was prepared in advance, and uh, I was going to preach another sermon in the series Listening to God's Story, last chapters of the book of Genesis. And uh, information on this topic was already posted uh, on social media. Everything was ready to go. But I felt somehow uneasy. I sensed that there is one specific issue that needs to be addressed. I continued to reflect on the issues that disturb our society today. Occasionally, my eye would catch a line or two uh, that my friends and my fellow believers, brothers and sisters, post on social media, reflecting their opinions on the hot issues today. And it became obvious to me that not everyone has the biblical perspective on some of the issues. And then when three different church members uh, almost simultaneously within a span of one day contacted me with questions on this specific matter, and one of them requested that I would prepare a sermon on the topic, I then made a conclusion that it was God speaking first to me personally and then through others uh, directing me to study another theme in the Bible. So I deleted the ad for the sermon already prepared and uh, posted another one on the sermon that I am preaching today. And the title is the Bible and Racism. The Bible and Racism. Now, my sermon will not be a political commentary on the current events. My goal is not to evaluate what happened on May 25 of this year specifically or the aftermath of that. My goal is simple, to look at the question of race and racism in the Bible and present whatever God's will is, as I was able to discover it for myself in the Bible, in God's holy book. But first, let's take a look at uh, the basic definitions. What is race? You may take a look at the first slide. According to Encyclopedia of Soci Soci Sociology, uh, a race is a historically formed group of people who have similar inherited external signs, such as skin, hair, eyes, nose and lips, body proportions, etc. Four major races are distinguished. Negroid, Australoid, Caucasoid, and Mongoloid. Another one Explanatory dictionary says that race is one of the groups into which mankind is conditionally divided, depending on the presence of a particular set of historically formed physical attributes, such as skin color, hairline features, head shape, body proportions, etc. It's worth noting and uh, underscoring that these distinctions, they are conditional. It says that mankind is conditionally divided. And uh, the third definition adds to that. According to the brief 
geographical dictionary, racial boundaries are fuzzy. There are many transitional and mixed forms. So the issue of race itself, first of all, is uh, something that has to do with external features. But even that is uh, very subjective. Initially, the uh, science would give us three main races, then astraloid was added, now some anthropologists uh, are adding Native Americans as a distinct group, so-called uh, original Indians, and so forth. So the question is uh, open. It is very subjective. It is uh, artificial. That's the definition of race. What is racism? Let's go back to encyclopedias and uh, uh, read from the Dictionary of Geography. Racism is the theory that the abilities and characteristics of people are determined by their belonging to one race or another. That one race can be biologically superior to another. And hence, the political program or social system based on such concept. Another definition from Handbook of Political Science says, racism is a set of concepts based on the belief of the physical and mental inequality of human races and on the decisive influence of racial differences in the history and culture of society on the original division of people into higher and lower races, of which the former are the only creators of civilization called to domination, and the latter are incapable of creating and even mastering high culture and are doomed to exploitation. That's the classical definition of racism. Of course, there are still people today who continue to believe this way. But racism more often is sublime. It's not easily detected. And many people who would never call or admit that they are racists in their thinking and attitude towards other people, they still fall under the category. Let me give you an illustration from Sponville Philosophical Dictionary. The author is writing, I am not a racist, my grandmother once told me. And after reflecting for a while, she added, in the end, it is not their fault that they were born black. Did you catch it? She pities people of a different skin color. It's not their fault as though it could be a fold to begin with. And then the author continues. She was already over 80 when I was a child, and she was busy with us much more than my parents and loved us more than anything. I admit I did not have the courage to explain to her, as I should, that her rejection of racism was based on purely racist convictions. Another time she said, I do not like Germans. They are all racist. The same reasoning logic based in this case on anti-German racism. As uh, one of the inscriptions in uh, United States town declares, we hate everyone equally, without distinction of race, religion, and color. Racism could be well hidden. So, what does the Bible say about racism? What can we learn from the holy book to guide us as believers? First of all, I'd like to look at some general statements 
about all the people and then go into some particulars. Let's open the book of Genesis, chapter 1, verses 26 through 28. Then God said, Let us make man in our image, after our likeness, and, and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the birds of the heavens, and over the livestock, all, and all, over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. So God created man in his own image, in the image of God he created him, male and female he created them, and God blessed them, and God said to them, Be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and subdue it, and have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the heavens and over every living thing that moves on the earth. The Bible states at the outset, at the very beginning, that the earth is populated from one couple. All humanity are descendants of one human couple. All people currently living have a common ancestor. This is one category of creatures. And then the Lord, the Lord told Adam and Eve, you can subdue and have dominion over all other created things. No uh, second class within the image of God creatures. Those who were created to emulate and to reflect the image of God. They are all equal. All humanity is one race. And then the, there are creatures who are created to be ruled over all the animal kingdom of the earth. Then in Genesis chapter 3, verse 20, there is another statement. The man called his wife's name Eve because she was the mother of all living. Adam and Eve are the progenitors of all people on the earth. The African and the Asian and the European and everyone else. They all have as their great, 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 and then many generations back, grandmother, which is Eve. The same goes about Adam. This is what the Bible tells us from the very beginning. When we turn to apostolic writings, we find a very important statement in the book of Acts, chapter 17, verse 26, which says, And he made from one man every nation of mankind to live on all the face of the earth, having determined allotted periods and the boundaries of their dwelling place. Periodically, people would ask me as a minister, where did the blacks come from? This question, though uh, sometime being motivated by the desire to just figure the things out, in itself is a racist question. Because here is what it presupposes. The premise is that Adam and Eve were white. Their children, therefore, were also white as grandchildren and so forth. And then all of a sudden, no, no one knows how and why, different shades of skin appeared. So the, the premise is that a white race is the original one. A question, where is it in the Bible? What skin color did Adam and Eve have? The Bible is silent on the matter. But we can ask a scientific question. Where does skin color and the thickness of the uh, fat in your eyelid is determined by? The answer is simple. 
by your genetic code. Then where did you get it? From your parents, of course. And where did they get it? From their parents. Now let's go back a couple of thousand years and thousands more. And we go back to Adam and Eve. In their genetic information, in their genetic code, was all versions of people currently living on our planet. That's the biblical account. We all are descendants of the same couple who were named Adam and Eve. These are general statements. Now, let's take a look at a couple of statements from the Bible regarding specifically black people, black in color. The Bible says uh, in the book of Genesis, chapter 10, verses 6 through 8, and then verse 10, about the ge genealogical tree of humankind. The sons of Ham, Cush, Egypt, Put, and Canaan. The sons of Cush, Seba, Havila, Sapta, Rama, and Sapteca. The sons of Rama, Sheba, and Dedan. Cush fathered Nimrod. He was the first on earth to be a mighty man. Verse 10, the beginning of his kingdom was Babel, Erek, Akkad, and Kalne in the land of Shinar. It is uh, important to know that the word for Kush often is translated as an Ethi Ethiopian or Ethiopia. Kush is Ethiopia, and Kushi in the original, in the Hebrew language, is Ethiopian. And this uh, word, uh, the, the etymology of the word Ethiopian in English language comes from the Greek, where it sounds basically the same, and the meaning of the term is he, literally a burned face, burned, darkened face. So in the Bible, the term Kush and the term Kushi as uh, the one who was born and is a descendant of Kush means a black colored person, not uh, necessarily an Ethiopian by geographical location. All dark-colored people could be called uh, kushi uh, in the original of the Bible. As, for example, the book of Jeremiah, chapter 13, verse 23 says, Can the Ethiopian change his skin or the leopard his spots? So, kushi is a black person with different shades. Of black. And what is very important to notice is that one of the descendants of this black person named Kush was Nimrod, who traveled to Mesopotamia, to the region of ancient uh, Babylon, and uh, created a kingdom there. It says that Babylon and Akkad come from Nimrod, who comes from Cush. So the Babylonians and Akkadians originated from a black person, not something that people would automatically assume, right? People in that region are not black uh, in the same sense as uh, Africans, for example, are. So when we study the Bible, it has a lot to say about colors, how different people settled, and so forth. Now, what is God's attitude toward people of a darker skin? Let's go to the book of Amos, chapter 9, verse 7. Are you not like the Cushites to me, 
O people of Israel, declares the Lord. Did I not bring up Israel from the land of Egypt and the Philistines from Kaftor and the Syrians from Kir? When God is speaking, when his direct speech is recorded, he says, you Israelites are identical, are the same to me as Cushites, the people with dark skin. Are you not like the Cushites to me, O people of Israel? The rhetorical question is asked. Then we can read another statement from, from the book of Psalms, chapter 68, verse 31, which says, Nobles shall come from Egypt. Cush shall hasten to stretch out her hands to God. Cush is uh, the black people. Will stretch hands to God, pray to him, and serve him, and worship him. This is God's attitude. This is his desire. All children of the earth are his children, regardless of how they look like. Next, I would like to briefly share with you three interesting stories about black people in the Bible. First one comes from the book of Numbers, chapter 12. Let's read verse 1. Miriam and Aaron spoke against Moses because of the Cushite woman whom he had married, for he had married a Cushite woman. Miriam, followed by Aaron, was against this. She spoke against Moses because he married a Cushite. He married a black woman. Now, we don't have time today to research who she was uh, exactly. Was it uh, a wife that Moses took in addition to Sephora, who was a Midianite? Or was uh, this term, the Cushite woman, used by Miriam as a derogative term, and she called a Midianite a black person? But in any case, she expressed her disapproval. She was against that. And nothing is mentioned that this woman was evil or not God-fearing or in any other way lacking something in terms of morality and spirituality. Miriam was against her as a being because she looked different. Here's God's reaction. Say in chapter, Numbers chapter 12, verses 9 and 10. And the anger of the Lord was kindled against them, and he departed. When the cloud removed from over the tent, behold, Miriam was leprous, like snow. And Aaron turned towards Miriam, and behold, she was leprous. The Lord is saying, you are rebuking Moses for a black person. Be white as snow. This is a very forceful statement at action from God, showing his disapproval of Miriam's behavior. You, you like white? Be white. Be with leprosy and be white as snow. By God's mercy, Miriam was cured one week later and she learned her lesson. But this passage clearly shows that God doesn't tolerate when his children are oppressed or despised, when they are treated badly. The next story comes from the book of uh, Jeremiah, the prophet. Let's read from chapter 38, verses 4 through 13. Then the official said to the king, 
Let this man be put to death, for he is weakening the hands of the soldiers who are, who are left in this city, and the hands of all the people by speaking such words to them. For this man is not seeking the welfare of this place, of, the, of this people, but their harm. King Zedekiah said, Behold, he is in your hands, for the king can do nothing against you. So they took Jeremiah and cast him into the cistern of Malchiah, the king's son, which was in the court of the guard, letting Jeremiah down by ropes. And there was no water in the cistern, but only mud. And Jeremiah sank in the mud. When Abed Malik, the Ethiopian, a eunuch who was in the king's house heard that they had put Jeremiah into the cistern. The king was sitting in the Benjamin gate. Abed Malek went from the king's house and said to the king, My lord the king, these men have done evil in all that they did to Jeremiah the prophet by casting him into the cistern. And he will die there of hunger, for there is no bread left in the city. Then the king commanded abed Malak the Ethiopian, Take thirty men with you from here and lift Jeremiah the prophet out of the cistern before he dies. So abed Malak took the men with him and went to the house of the king to a wardrobe in the storehouse and took from their old rags and worn-out clothes, which he let down to Jeremiah in the cistern by robes. Then abed Malak the Ethiopian said to Jeremiah, Put the rags and clothes between your armpits and the robes. Jeremiah did so. Then they drew Jeremiah up with ropes and lifted him out of the cistern. And Jeremiah remained in the court of the guard. Very interesting stories. The princes, the high officials of the land who were Jewish in origin, they went out against God's messenger, Jeremiah the prophet, and intended to kill him. They threw him in this opening in the earth, in the cistern, in the mud, and the idea was that he would starve there to death. The person of a different skill, skin color, an Ethiopian in the original Cushite, he had mercy. He had a different attitude towards God's prophet. And he petitioned the king, and Jeremiah's life was spared. And later, in chapter 39 of the book of Jeremiah, verses 15 through 18 say the following. The word of, Lord, the, the, word of the Lord came to Jeremiah while he was shut up in the court of the guard. Go and say to abed Malak the Ethiopian, Thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of, the God of Israel, Behold, I will fulfill my words against this city for harm and not for good, and they shall be accomplished before you on that day. But I will deliver you on that day, declares the Lord, and you shall not be given into the hand of the men of whom you are afraid, for I will surely save you. And you shall not fall by the sword, but you shall have your life as a prize of war, because you have put your trust in me, declares the Lord. What a vivid difference between the people of God who belong to the covenant and this person, a black-colored person who trusted in God, who placed value in Jeremiah as God's mouthpiece, and he listened and believed God's prophecies. He was saved. He was spared. The third story comes from apostolic writings, from the book of Acts, chapter 13, verses 1 through 3. Now there were in, in the church of Antioch prophets and teachers, Barnabas, Simeon, who was called 
Niger, Lucius of Cyrene, Manain, a lifelong friend of Herod the Tetrarch, and Saul. While they were worshiping the Lord and fasting, the Holy Spirit said, Set apart for me Barnabas and Saul for the work to which I have called them. Then, after fasting and praying, they laid their hands on them and sent them off. This passage describes Christians, leaders in the Christian church in Antioch. They are called prophets and teachers, and one of them was Simeon, who was called Niger. Now, Niger in the Greek, in the original, literally means black. A black person was among those who served the Lord there. And they received a revelation from the Lord saying that Saul and Barnabas should embark on their first missionary trip. And they laid their hands on them and sent them off. God used a black-colored person to become a vehicle of his revelation, to lay his hands on Saul and to bless him for the missionary journey. As we see, there is no difference in attitude. There is no discriminatory attitude on the part of God towards any of his children, any of the humans on this planet. But there is one passage in the Bible that was used for many centuries to prove and to use as a passage to subdue and subjugate people of a different skin color. The passage is the book of Genesis, chapter 9, verses 24 through 27. When Noah awoke from his wine and knew what his youngest son had done to him, he said, Cursed be Canaan. A servant of servants shall he be to his brothers. He also said, Blessed be the Lord, the God of Shem, and let Canaan be his servant. May God enlarge Japheth and let him dwell in the tents of Shem, and let Canaan be his servant. Here's the historical understanding of this passage. God supposedly cursed Ham, one of the sons of Noah. And Ham is a progenitor of Africans. The descendants of Ham are Africans, black people, a cursed race. And since the Bible says that he will be a servant, in some other versions, a slave, this passage was used many times in books and so forth and sermons to proclaim that this is the order of things, that the black race is below the white race, and this is how God instituted that. This idea was used to justify the slave trade in the British Empire, including the American colonies. Later, when slavery was officially abolished, later, the segregation in the United States of America was uh, justified by the same statement, by the same verses in the Bible. Different rooms for white and colored people, different water fountains, different places to eat, different schools, and so forth. Many white people in the United States looked down on the black people because of their religious beliefs, because they thought that the Bible is teaching racism. Now, let's ask ourselves. I will ask two simple questions. 
Please look at the text and give me a biblical answer. The first question, did Noah curse Ham or not? The answer is no. Noah cursed Canaan. Verse 25 says, cursed be Canaan. Now, we don't have time to ask why, but here's the fact. Ham was not cursed. The Canaanites, uh, they are the people whose land the Israelite conquered at the time of Moses. These are not Africans by any means. Then the second question is, who shall be a servant? Who shall be a so-called slave? According to the Bible, is it Ham? Is it his descendants? No, it is Canaan, verse 25, 26, and 27 repeated altogether three times. As we have already determined, the Cushites, the descendants of Cush, one of the four sons of Ham, lived in different places, including the Mesopotamia, not Africa by any stretch. So there is no any biblical or anthropological ground to connect this passage to slave trade, segregation, or racism of any kind. The Bible just doesn't have anything that could be even remotely connected to racists' ideas. My sermon today is titled The Bible and Racism. The Bible plainly teaches that the earth is populated from one couple of humans. All people have a common ancestor. Adam and Eve are the progenitors of all the people on the earth. For God, all races, all nations, all ethnicities are equal. They are all his children, and he loves the whole world. He loves all of us. All the people of the earth, therefore, are brothers and sisters. So, now a personal question. What is your attitude towards people who look different from you, who don't look like you? Please look deep inside and uh, try to let God's truth and God's word shine through all corners of your soul. I can recall how some people, some secretly, some not so secretly, were worried when Barack Obama was elected the president. Some were saying, now blacks will get the upper hand in this country. And it was a fear. My question is, so what? Is it the whites who shall and should have the upper hand, or the red ones, or the yellow ones, or anyone, or brown ones, or lighter brown, or darker shade? Why this should be a scare? This is another example of racist thinking. Sometimes, maybe not even realized by the person. What about demeaning terminology? that some people use that seem to suggest that there are races that are lower, less significant, have less value. This is something to think about and to get yourself checked against the Word of God. The book of Revelation, chapter 14, verses 6 and 7 I have the following. Then I saw another angel flying directly overhead with an internal gospel to proclaim to those who dwell on the earth, to 
every nation and tribe and language, language and people. And he said with a loud voice, Fear God and give him glory, because the hour of his judgment has come, and worship him who made heaven and earth, the sea and the springs of water. This is our mission, to proclaim the everlasting gospel, to proclaim the so-called three angels' message to the whole world, to different people of different backgrounds. And this is impossible to do if you don't accept them as God does. Before that, in chapter 7 of the book of Revelation, in verses 9 and 10, there's the following picture. After this I looked, and behold, a great multitude that no one could number from every nation, from all tribes and peoples and languages, standing before the throne and before the Lamb, clothed in white robes with palm branches in their hands, and crying out with a loud voice, Salvation belongs to our God who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. When all the saved people are pictured in the kingdom of God, they are all different from all nations, all races, all ethnicities, all languages. They are all clothed with white robes, and they are praising God and worshiping Him. This is the kingdom of God. This is how it looks like. So if someone has a dislike for some person, because that person belongs to another race or ethnicity. Ask God to pour out his love, his love into your heart so that you could look at all people the same way that he does. Otherwise, if there is a person who dislikes and diminishes people who look different than he or she. If you don't have that love of God in your heart, then unfortunately, you won't be able to get into this group of the saved people because there is no racism in the kingdom of God. I am very honored to belong to a group of believers who are very racially and ethnically diverse. The Seventh-day Adventist Church in the United States of America is uh, the most diverse religious group in the country. Let's take a look at this graph. This is a peer research result that shows that Seventh-day Adventists, they are mixed on the scale from 0 to 10. They are at 9.1, way ahead of any other Christian denomination. This is a picture taken at the last general conference of Seventh-day Adventists. Some of the delegates are put together, and they all look different. This is a picture of the kingdom of God. May this picture be the one that you have in your mind. And may the will of God and his attitude toward all humankind be yours in every little detail. May God bless you. Amen.